Hi, this is Julia with Storked, the podcast about the many ways we are defining and creating family. In this episode, I want to introduce you to Molly, who's going to talk to us about creating a blended family. I reached out to Molly because she is the person that I turn to whenever I need life advice that has a particularly positive or warm or inviting spin. And that's exactly what she's going to share about her family building experience. What I love about this story is that she talks about adding her own magic to her life. And by taking great leaps of faith, by ending one marriage and beginning another and creating a large blended family, she calls this family a big soup of a family. She has created her own path, which she says is even more magical as a result of her taking these great leaps. In addition, by doing this, by by making these moves and creating this family, she says she's demonstrated to her children a sense of possibility. And I really like that. That's a nice way of thinking about our family journey is what choices can we make to demonstrate to ourselves and to others a sense of the possible. So here is Molly. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. You are a friend of mine, and I reached out to you recently because I was exploring what a blended family might look like in the context of just a personal curiosity. And you gave me some really good feedback and advice and told me this beautiful journey about creating your family, which I thought would be interesting to share with our audience. So why don't we start with an introduction? Molly, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I um, have been a mother and stepmother and wife and um, a yogini. I have studied feng shui for many years. Um, I love gardening. I am just learning about plants and I just anything healing, anything in the healing realm has been interesting to me. And um, yeah, that's what I like to spend my time doing. I love cooking as well. I'm not a great cook, but I do love cooking. <laughs> That's wonderful. And can you articulate what your family currently looks like, how you currently define your family? Yes. Um, so currently we have eight in our immediate family. It's, it's a blended immediate family. So it's me and my husband, my two children that I had with my first marriage, and then he had four daughters when we got married. So together we have six children. And how long have you been a blended family? Is this a relatively new thing? Um, You know, no, it's been about nine and a half years. So let's start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about how this blended family came to be. Well, it just, it just kind of happened. I would say kind of mystically. I had two young children at the time. I've been married to my first husband for, I don't know, about 10 or 10 years. And Around the time when my children were maybe one and three, started having some feelings that my husband and I, my husband at the time and I were kind of drifting apart and being drawn to different ways to spend our time and just not vibrating basically at the same frequency. And um, at that point, I started studying yoga a lot, trying to learn more about why I was feeling the way I did. And, you know, I, I think of yoga as the study of the self and so just diving into like, you know, just understanding myself more. And um, I had reached a new level of maturity as a woman, having had two children. And it was just a good time just to kind of stop and, and look at myself. Take stock a little bit. It just took me down this path that, that basically led me to the realization that I wasn't in a relationship that was fulfilling to myself or my partner in the way that it was possible to be fulfilled in a partnership. And did that happen like in one yeah. big aha moment or was it a gradual um, coming to the awareness that your current relationship at the time wasn't serving? You know, it was over a period, I would say of two or three years when I was, I was studying, I was reading, I was taking yoga classes. I was, I took several re- retreats alone and there was one aha moment at one of those retreats that it was all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, like I, this isn't going to work anymore. And I can remember like where I was sitting, I was, I was out in Colorado at a Buddhist retreat center and I was just sitting on the bed during kind of a break time between seminars. And I just 
it was like my heart cracked open just for what I knew was going to have to happen. How, in that moment when you have this awareness that something has to change in your life and that something is your marriage, did you immediately start taking steps to change the relationship? Tell us about what came out of that awakening or that moment. Well, I came back, I actually got really bad pneumonia, which is so interesting that, you know, of course, it makes so much sense. It all manifested in my throat and I have to say something. And the thing is, we had been having conversations that were in this realm. It wasn't totally out of the blue. We've been talking about how we've been kind of in and out of being able to connect for a few years, like I said. Um, so when I came home from the treat center, I said, you know, I just, I, I, I learned a lot. I really tried to share what I had learned, the potency of the teachings I'd received. And it, it seemed to me there was no absorption from him on that. So it validated that that feeling I'd gotten during the retreat even more. And that's when I just said, you know, maybe we just need to take a a real break, like really just not live in the same place for a little while. Um, And so it's interesting because he wasn't super surprised. I think that he had also been feeling disconnected as well. It's just, he didn't want to, he didn't want to act on it. And so it was kind of a natural progression to that step of just making space And then when the space was made, then everything started to happen really quickly. It's it's a strange situation because immediately we both opened ourselves to another relationship. And it was a relationship with people we had each known for many years and been working with for, you know, each of us for several years. I think for both of us to realize that we had, we had space in our hearts in that way for this other person. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you have an awareness. There's a moment where you guys decide to take some physical space away from one another. And in that, you both simultaneously looked around and had other people in your lives that were meaningful. Yes, that we were able to connect with people in a way that we hadn't been able to connect with each other in a while. I mean, my um, first husband always says, like, we had a really good run. Yeah. You know, we were always, we were always really good. We didn't fight a lot. I mean, we just, it's just that we grew apart and we just were, were brave enough, I guess, you know, it's easy to say in hindsight, we were brave enough, even though it took years of courage to build up to it, just to realize that and to acknowledge that and to be able to step away physically in that physical space helped us energetically kind of move more very quickly into a new way of life. Do you guys talk now about that moment of bravery? Do you look back and you're like, oh my God, we were so crazy or, you know, thank God we found this decision point together at the same time, or is it sort of a non-discussed moment in time? You know, it is, it does come up, um, not exactly that tangibly, but in, we spend time together. We talk a lot. We we definitely co-parent and we have dinners together and things like that. And we enjoy each other. We enjoy each other's spouses. Um, but it's more kind of allusions to, you know, it was good while it lasted, you know, we're in a good place now, like look all the, all the good that's come out of that change we made, that kind of thing, allu- alluding to, you know, we came to the conclusion that this was the right thing. It's really a, it's such a abstract thing to discuss about how it felt to step away from that relationship. It's just, it, it literally, it did feel like stepping into a different universe once we both we're okay with doing it and felt the freedom to do it. So can you describe what the new universe felt like? You know, did it have a feeling sensation? You know, I would say the, the biggest word that comes to mind is just free and light. I just felt, I felt ha- joyful again for the first time in a while. Like this heaviness that had been like a, you know, just a huge weight on me had felt like it just dissolved like overnight. And, Suddenly, I felt like I could move more easily. I felt like I was able to be in the world in a way that just was more natural. And people noticed immediately. They were like, you seem amazing. You know, how are we? And I was thinking, like, I'm going through, like, a divorce, you know. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm so it just, it, it just made me feel like the timing was right for the big move that we yeah. made. And, of course, the devastating part of it was, what are we doing to our children? You know, that was the only part that hadn't been for them there. I mean, of course, I was sad for 
my relationship, which had been, you know, really great with my first husband. I was sad for that to end for a lot of reasons. But at the same time, I felt like we had grown to that place where it was time. And so I was just mostly concerned about what am I doing to my children. And I had a lot of guilt around that, and so I, especially since I was the initiator. I'm not sure if I had ever initiated the discussions and being honest with my feelings. I'm not sure that he ever would have brought it up. Oh, interesting. So how did you combat that guilt or, or how do you currently combat the guilt? You know, it took a while. So in the beginning, I didn't have it. I had stepped into that new universe where I felt really powerful and joyful and free and light. And so I kind of went on that ride for a while and, and had a lot of confidence. And then little pieces of it kind of seemed like it kind of came back to haunt me a little later. And Oh, that's an interesting yeah. image. Yeah, I think maybe those little hauntings were not having spent enough time in between. Do you know what I mean? Like immediately going in to this other relationship, I probably needed a little more buffer time to settle into myself a little more. Um, but, you know, it's hard to be reasonable at times, you know. <laughs> I think it's hard to be reasonable in general, but when you're going through a massive change in life, I think that's a fair thing to say. So I think those pieces that I didn't completely work through within myself, maybe those were the kernels of doubt, you could say, that caused the guilt. And they would creep up at, you know, at, at times when I least expected it. And it took some years of being in that and being in the reality of a new marriage, you know, there's so much magic in a new relationship yeah tell us about the magic i um as i recall and it's been a while since you've shared it with me you have a meet cute story that's kind of adorable (laughs) i love that you remember that um yeah so the first time my current husband and i met i actually came in late to a yoga class and this was before i I was teaching yoga so this was probably about three or three or four years maybe before he and i got married so back up three or four years, I um, came into this yoga class and I was accidentally, I guess I was like 15 to 30 minutes late. I got the class time wrong, which I've never done in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I came in and all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, everyone is like in the middle of a pose. And so the teacher looked at me and she just kind of beckoned to me to come and she put me, the room was rectangular and everyone set up their mats kind of across from each other. And then she kind of walked down the middle. So she's like, come here. I always love and I'm always terrified when the yoga instructors do that because you're like, you you come out of certain poses and you're looking directly at a stranger's face. It's it's very intimate. Very intimate. So we're sitting there and all of a sudden we're we're in tree pose. And so we go up and we're on the left side, you know, I'm standing on my left leg and the right leg comes up. I just immediately in tree pose and my gaze is just directly (laughs) into the eyes of this, this man, this mystery man. And I remember, like, of course, you're not really looking in the eyes. You're kind of looking kind of inward and outward, but not at anyone or anything. Or maybe trying not to fall. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just kind of generally in that direction. But I definitely got a really, like, intense, energetic feeling. And I, I, it was just like, I just felt this this power. And it was probably, part, if I had to guess, partially him, partially, like, what we were, what was going to come of this counter, but something dropped into me that I was like, wow. And then I came out of the pose and then I did kind of like check him out. I'm like, was that him? What was that? (laughs) And then right after the class, um, the teacher was like, I want you two to meet. And it turned out he was getting ready to buy the studio. His hobby was yoga. And so he was, um, wanted to buy the studio and he was, that's what was about to happen. And she said, yeah, you've just finished yoga teacher training. I know you want to teach, so you two should meet and talk about what positions there could be. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, that intervention. There's always somebody who's like nudging a little situation along. Exactly. So, yeah, it's kind of a wild story. So you meet this person. At some point in your trajectory, you move from one world that feels a little heavy and into the next world that feels a little free through the passageway of a divorce. And then you start creating a new family together. Tell us about that. Were you intentional about it? Did you say, okay, we're going to create this family. We're going to blend. It's going to look like X, Y, Z. Or did it just sort of evolve and emerge? It really just evolved and emerged. Right when I started teaching for him, we started becoming friends. And 
we would just through studio events, I, I got really involved with the studio and I would bring my two children with me to different events and he would bring his children sometimes too. And so they became kind of friends along with the other teachers and children, you know, who were at the studio. And so that just kind of happened. And I, I, I really thought nothing of it. I mean, even that first encounter, it, it, I didn't feel a romantic tinge of any sort. It wasn't until the very end that I felt anything like that. It was just more of a really a deep admiration and deep interest and really just, just loved engaging and our conversations were really great. And um, so anyway, we had built this relationship really slowly with ourselves and our children. And so by the time we realized we were in love and wanted to get married, it was kind of, it was, I don't want to say easy, but it was just, it was like the kids were already so familiar. Our families were already somewhat blended. You know, we were all family friends. Two of his daughters were probably not, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily me, but they weren't excited about him getting married to someone else. I think they liked me a lot until they, you know, found out we were getting married. <laughs> and then they were kind of like, wait a minute, because, you know, he had so much focus on them when he would spend time with them he would just put everything into them. And so, you know, that was, that was hard, you know, to have to share him. Maybe you were encroaching on their territory. I think maybe a little, I mean, it was, it wasn't any, any big disaster or anything, but there was a little pushback, you know, of when we made that decision, that announcement, I noticed that things weren't as, as easy. There were some hiccups with some moods and some, you know, reactions here and there. But they were teenagers, you know, they were. And teenagers don't have moods at all. They're not known for that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so so the magic's happening for you guys. So I'm really curious about this this journey because where we left off, the magic's happening, you guys are starting to get planned for marriage. And where I now know you, you've got a beautiful blended family dynamic with all the different parties involved. What was the pathway to get from there to here? It's weird. It's just the whole thing seems unbelievable. First of all, it seems like there were all these different little pockets of time, almost like chapters in a book, you know, of here to there. And like when we first started letting the kids hang out together, then we when we first got married, and then when the kids were little and we were with them all the time, and then then you know the phase where they start like his girls started kind of going off and doing their own thing more. And then it became this way. And there are all these little chapters. And I mean, some of them were easier than others. You know, the whole thing has been the work in progress. You know, it's never felt like there's like one set way that our family is. It's just, it's always changing. Hmm. You know, it's just literally like, I think having kids in general, and then when you have six to add to the mix, it's like this <laughs> this constant. And, you know, the thing I've realized at this point in life is just kind of looking back because some are getting like a couple are out of college now and, and they're getting older is that yoga brought us together and we, we had this yoga studio that we built together and the kids really helped us build it as well. They were there all the time and it was a big part of our life. But that, that was not sustainable. Like uh, us doing kind of our thing I would just say like, we, it's almost like we put that on hold and that sounds kind of depressing, but like having six kids, you know, and having all these things going on, but like, I think we have some other creative projects and journeys definitely that are before us, but it's almost like they've been put on pause, like the kids. So there's like a, an upcoming chapter to continue your creative journey. Yeah. Definitely. So I guess I would say that was unexpected. I think we we got into it and we juggled it for all for a while and we thought we could do it all. And and sometimes I get kind of down about that. I shouldn't feel defeated. Like we put so much into all these children and that's what we really wanted to do and needed to do right now. And that's the amount of energy we had. And some people can do it all, but this is what we could do. And there's still going to be time to continue our projects that are just ours, you know, later down the road. So what were some of the things that really worked for you as a family when you're putting the energy into the kids? If I were to call you up and ask for advice or feedback, what are some of the success moments or tools or tips or tricks that you could offer? I would say, um, you know, like back to those chapters when they're, when they're young, we had so much fun doing creative projects all the time. I mean, 
baking things. They made up nonstop plays and costume. They would make costumes. They were so creative. Because you've got um, a lot of actors who can participate. Definitely, yes. I mean, I think that's what made it work. Um, we had, we do scavenger hunts and make up, we play games, we do karaoke, I mean, on and on. And then once they got a little older, we started traveling a lot. They were great little travelers. And we're so lucky that we were able to, you know, we would do local things. We'd just go hiking or like camping and things like that. We also got to take some bigger trips together. And that was really wonderful to be able to explore the world together. And um, so, and then now, you know, now that everyone's kind of getting a little bit older and more scattered, I just think we, we just try to be really intentional about when we can all be together just to make time for you know dinner together and time together and sitting, you know, sitting and trying to spend have good conversations together. But yeah, I would say the energy that we put into those younger years really probably they took the edge off the maybe the feelings of sadness for the children mm-hmm. for their original parents not being together. Because I saw this this other we had this other experience with us that was really exciting and and fun. I think I think that if my husband and I like looking back, if we had just kind of gotten babysitters and kind of done our thing, and you know, and that's one way to do it. I I think that maybe that could have been harder for my children. And we did, of course, have plenty of time. The nice thing about being divorced is that you actually have plenty of time to you have you have time alone. <laughs> so you mean I, when the kids are visiting your spouse? Yes. Um, in, in my situation, that was a nice thing. What I was the like, co-parenting arrangement with you guys? It's it's like every other weekend, my kids go to their dads, but it's also very fluid. I'm very open to flexibility in that. And as far as we live close and we are close. So like, especially during the summers, if they want to go spend more time, that's fine. That was just when they were little. Now that they drive, they can do whatever they, I mean, they they're generally here. <laughs> and my husband's girls were generally with their mother. And then here only every, every other weekend. That was a general rule. And in our situation, it gave my, my current husband and I time where we could be together and kind of catch our breath from everything. We'd have like a big week with the kids or a big weekend with the kids. And then we might have the next weekend might be just us. And that was really sacred time. Oh, that's lovely. It wasn't time, it wasn't time when I felt like we could be like really creative and do kind of explore our projects together, but it was time that we could just rest and be together. Yeah. What's interesting about your story and many blended families is that you sit in both the position of being the step parent and the parent who has to relinquish your child to another step parent. Um, I don't know if that's the right terminology, but you've had to come into an existing family structure and you've had to open space in your family structure for somebody else to come in. Can you talk about the contrast between those two experiences? Hmm. It's, it is kind of interesting because the, the stepmother of my children, um, I actually feel like we would be friends even if this weren't, you know, if we weren't in this life <laughs> situation together. I really like her. We really connect. We, you know, we really enjoy each other. That must make it so much easier, you know, when you, yes. you like the person that you're working with. And the, the thing about her in the beginning, she didn't have any children. So she really poured herself completely. She had all the, all this mother energy that she wanted to give to my children. So I was so grateful for that. Well, um, was it nice to have an additional source of mother energy or did you feel like uncomfortable that the mother energy was coming from somebody other than you? I see what you're saying. There were like a couple times, definitely that feeling of, was she doing a better job than I am? I, I should have thought of that, you know? <laughs> well, you know, they would say, well, she told us this, how she should do this. And I would think, oh, she's a better mother. You know, just that <laughs> little bit of a human reaction. But um, but for the most part, I really, I feel like she was very respectful of, you know, me being their, their mother and her being their stepmother. For my stepdaughter's mother, I don't think she has ever been really comfortable with with, I mean, she didn't want the relationship to end. It had ended. So by the time I stood across from my current husband in that class, they had already been divorced. So their relationship had, was already over. So it, it had nothing to do with me at all. Um, at the same, but, but any, you know, regardless of that fact, she wasn't happy about mm-hmm. him getting remarried. So 
you know, that transferred into her girls. And, and, you know, she was, she was cordial to me whenever we would encounter each other, but she was never warm to me. And so I do think that limited my ability to get really, really close to my stepdaughters for one thing. And for them to get close to me, you know, for us to be close with each other, just because I don't think their mother has ever been comfortable with the situation. Yeah. And as a child, you never want to do something that might further hurt a parent um, or come across as a betrayal or something like that. Exactly. So if you were giving advice to somebody who is looking at becoming a step parent or welcoming another party, another parent into their parenting relationship. Do you have any advice or feedback? How do you make it um, a positive experience? I, I really think that if you are truly head over heels in love with each other, with the person that you start stepping into a new relationship with, I think that other things will fall into place. I don't think there's any perfect situation. Um, I feel like in our situation, we had very little that wasn't perfect, but we still had imperfections. That's really lovely. So I think that if you, if you really trust that, that kind of original bond that is there, that you can handle, you know, I, I think it's being able to handle the downs and that's, true. that's what any relationship is about. And if you have that kind of core love in place, then I think that you can handle those waves, those those down waves more. Um, so tell us about any surprises that you came across in the way to building a blended family, either positive or, or those that you had to work through. Um, I mean, I guess the reality that it wasn't going to be perfect, you know, that it was, it was very smooth sailing. Like I said, in the beginning, those early years, the kids were all little, we were all, we were newly married, you know, everything was easy and good. And we were still doing our passions and we were juggling it all. Um, and then when things got harder and then I got, I had, I had to take care of my dad, who got really, really sick and we got some things thrown in the mix that made it become harder and people were going through different things. And so there became some rocks in the road, you know? And so I guess the realization that, oh, okay, this is also, this is also real life. The new universe where I was free and joyful and <laughs> light and it kind of, you know, now it has its own you know, challenges. Yeah. So I guess that. Yeah, that life is real, that even, even when it's working really well and you're in love with your partner and things are going as smooth as they could be, it's still life, right? It's, yes. it's never this like perfect, idyllic, rom-com situation. Yeah, and I think I'm a, I'm a dreamer and I'm, I like the mystical and the magical. And I like the fairy tale. And so, of course, like, you know, I, I went off on that path and I thought, oh, okay, real life found me here too. <laughs> Can blended families be mystical and magical and fairy tale esque, or are they just by nature more rooted in reality? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. I mean, I would say I, it just depends on the families. And I haven't thought about this until you asked this question, but I feel like in our situation, we we added more mystical and magical and fairy tale by changing the course of our lives and creating this big organic kind of soup <laughs> of a family. I think it gave everyone a um, higher sense of creative possibilities. Ooh. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so by following your heart, by following that moment where you know you want to be with somebody or you want to reshape your relationship with your ex or whatever it is, by following your intuition, you're creating a sense for what could be for your kids. I, I believe that's true. Yeah. I believe that I believe that in the beginning, I didn't even know that's what I was doing. I, I didn't do that consciously necessarily or intentionally, like you asked earlier, but I just did it because it felt like everything in me was wanting to move in that direction and had to move in that direction. And then there was that, I told you that little period of doubt. And then I think I'm, I'm coming to a place now where I can look back a little and see, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all making sense. So this weekend, we were going up to our little family cabin about an hour from here, and there was this detour in the road, and 
we got on Google and it said to go this really weird way that didn't make any sense. And we kind of knew the area. So we were like, no, no, we're just going to go the detour. <laughs> we went the detour and it popped us out, you know, where after a while, kind of it's somewhat where we wanted to be. Yeah. But it made me realize that, you know, it's okay to trust the detour, trust the detour. I feel like, you know, that was a, in a way that was a detour in my life. And you know, it, it took me in all these different directions and over mountains and different places I never intended to go. But, and of course, my kids got to come along for the ride because <laughs> they were my kids. I love working. this analogy. It reminds me of that song, Bless the Broken Road, that led me straight to you. Is like the lyrics. It's a country song. From I don't know it. Maybe it oh, I'll, I won't sing it um, because I can't sing <laughs> <laughs> but it's running through my head right now. If you could take a peek inside. Um, I love this. Trust the detour. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, the detour is where the juice is. I mean, I think there's a reason for the detour. Yeah. That, that was, I guess that's what I came with. There, there's a reason. It's going to take you back to the place you need to be. Who knows? I mean, the place you thought you wanted to go, it's okay. Maybe there's a detour and maybe it just takes you back somewhere a little bit different. But ultimately, I'm still me on the other side of this giant detour that I guess has been the last, you know, whatever, 15 years of my life. And I think that that detour has made things more magical and more mystical. Like we said, all these powerful ways of being in the world that aren't just so expected and aren't so programmed, you know, just, we just basically threw out the map. Yeah. Yeah. You've literally rewritten the map. What do you wish had been on the map at the beginning, you know, if you're looking at a blank map and you've thrown out the old one and you're recreating, do you wish there were any milestones or big signs go this way or, or anything that would have been helpful? What would have been helpful for you, I guess? Oh, hmm. I guess just, just trusting, you know, the way. Because I have to say, if we're talking literal maps, I am a disaster at geography. And if we're extrapolating that to like life decision making, it's probably still the case that like my map is always upside down or I'm reading it wrong or there's a chunk missing um, and I'm headed the wrong direction. So I like the trust component, but it's scary when you think about it from a map making standpoint, because God knows where you're going. <laughs> like, where are you going? Yes, I know. But I think ultimately that we do have some kind of a, a, a navigation system that if you look back on your life, and for me, if I look back on my life, I felt lost at times, but I actually was, was just perfect that I, I needed to be where I was at the time. Oh my God, that's so powerful. Um, and so, yeah, I think that trusting that you know the way is whenever I was feeling in doubt, it would have been nice to have that sign pop up on the map. Yep. So if you're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner some years down the road and one of the kids said to you, you know, I watched you in relationship with my father, my stepfather, your current husband, or I watched you in building this family and I learned X from you. What do you hope they learn? Hmm. That's a great question. I guess the first things that came to mind were trust yourself follow your heart, you know, I know there's are cliche phrases, but I think that's, I think those have been powerful tools that I don't necessarily embrace every single day. And that's why I, sometimes I have the doubt and the guilt and all those things. But I think that those things have been guiding forces for me. And I hope that they've come through in my interactions with my children. It'll be interesting to see how they how they all grow up. I have noticed, I'll say this, like one, one thing I'll say is I, I have noticed just with my nieces, nephews, and other friends, children, and people who aren't in a blended family, who I'm close to, and this is a huge generalization, but that I've noticed that there's more resilience in blended families in the children. Wow. Where do you think that comes from? Um, you know, I've, I've had this conversation openly with my friends who aren't in blended families. They've asked me, I'm, I'm very close to someone who we've had these honest conversations, and I've said, you know, I mean, uh, first of all, children have their strengths and their challenges, of course. Um, but one thing I think my children have is resilience, and I think it is because of our blended family. I mean, I just think at an early age, they realize that life is not just a script, and life is of changes and detours and it's okay you're still you're still supported and you're still loved 
And I think it's made them just more resilient to the world around them, to their circumstances, to the people around them. It's made them more open to different people. And I think that's all because they had to be more open in their life just to, you know, do they had to accept a more open lifestyle. Yeah, I'm curious if it has to do with resiliency around change because their lives changed in a couple of times yeah. or if it has to do with having additional adults because, you know, the other term for step parent is bonus parent, you know, bonus mom, bonus mm-hmm. dad, bonus parent. Do you think, you know, having a lot of adult voices is a benefit? Does it contribute to that resiliency or is the resiliency really about the change? That really could be true. I think that's a great point because I've always thought of, I've always thought, gosh, my kids have four great parents. They're so lucky. I mean, they have all these perspectives. Plus, like, I very rarely get, get annoyed with my children because they're not with me 100%. Of the time. <laughs> I think that's why. Cause they're, you, you have know, more like, patience because you have distance sometimes? Oh, I think so. I think, like, I'm not handling the full load mm. of the parenting. You know, it's it's two other parents to get involved. And if there's anything going on, if there's anything that we need to talk about, we all four give our opinions about one child, you know? So, um, yeah, so I think that's a very, very good point. That's something I'd like to think a bit more about. Maybe it's a combination. Is it parenting by committee then, if everyone's giving their, or is like <laughs> in certain work decisions, we may get a collective piece of feedback, but there's one person who ultimately gets to make a call. Um, where does that fall? <laughs> I like to think it's me, I guess. <laughs> Okay, but I like to get, I like to bring everybody to the table at least. <laughs> That's, I like that. I really love having the input. I love hearing other people's opinions, and especially when it involves my children, <laughs> you know, because I want them to get as much kind of input um, and any decision they're confused about as possible. So, yeah, I mean, it's that it's true. It takes a village. I, I've absolutely experienced that in my mm-hmm. life as as a parent. It's nice to have the built-in village. Yeah. Yes. Is there anything we haven't covered that you think is important to communicate to the world about blended families? I guess the only other thing I would say is that looking back, I wish I had been, I guess, less less fearful about um, doing too many things together initially. What do you mean by that? But right in the beginning, we didn't do a lot of things together. Like right when I got remarried and my first husband got remarried, we didn't immediately start doing dinners with the children together, like as a bigger family, as a bigger blended family. It's, it's interesting now because I'm at a point in life <laughs> where like I think of us as like this big, like 15 person family, you know, because we are co-parenting. So last and final question, if you were to define family, what family means to you in a word or a handful of words, what would it be? Um, I, I guess home is what it feels like to me. Ooh, that's nice. Family is home. But, you know, there's one more thing. I just realized I would want to re-answer that question, which I like this better because this is a better word to describe home, (laughs) which is a soft place to land. A soft place to land. So your definition of family is a soft place to land. Yeah, I'd like to refine it to that. And that is for you, for the kids, for everyone? I think for all of us. So, you know, a summary of that would be home, but a soft place to land, because I like that it could be on so many levels, you know, you, um, it's a place where you can land, you feel like if you're, if you're needing to kind of, to ground, to take cover, to take comfort, to just rest, to laugh, to sleep, to, you know, just all the things that we need to make us feel whole to me, or in that soft place to land. Well, that's beautiful. Um, well, thank you, Molly, so much for your time today. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And I really am grateful for everything that you shared with us today. Thank you for listening to Storked with your host, Julia Carroll. This podcast is changing the conversation around the ways people define and create family. For more information, visit storkedpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter. And while you're there, leave us a message describing what a modern family means to you. That's S-T-O-R-K-D podcast.com.